Right, well this is our third talk from WEG um, in the sort of spring summer months. Uh, tonight we're focusing on um, our homes uh, and the energy that the home uses. So uh, hopefully you get something from the evening, uh, but please contribute as well, because I know a lot of you have got either you know, panels, as I call them, solar panels, or air source heat pumps. And um, I just think there's, any, yeah, there's one person who's got a ground source heat pump, but I don't think they're here tonight. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I thought, yeah. yeah. I know, I'll just clear my glasses a bit. So, um, so um, we've got a variety of sort of people who can contribute during the evening, so please do that. Um, so, moving on. This is going to be sort of the running order for the evening. Um, I think most people know me in the village, either from the film club or walking the dog around the village. I'm Paul, I'm Paul. Uh, Emma Adams, to my left, is going to talk um, on several topics tonight, but principally on uh, insulating your house and some sort of uh, energy saving uh, aspects connected with your house. And Nick um, Tuvik is going to talk about um, his experience with his air, air source heat pump. And then Karen somewhere who's there is not talking tonight, but she's our expert on Rachel. It's a good night, isn't it? <laughs> Rachel is going to talk about, um, no, she's not going to talk tonight. But she can't be there, I think we've talked about it. some slides in front But she's an expert on biodiversity. So anything to do with biodiversity, then uh, go that way. <laughs> okay then, so um, we'll kick off then. I'm not going to run through that, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, first couple of topics are sort of more of a general nature, uh, before we actually get into the, the house or the home. Um, the first one is just to re-emphasise the direction of travel which the government is taking uh, energy consumption by um, you mean we've read an awful lot that gas um, is not going to be available in terms of putting gas boilers into homes, um, but also oil is going to be stopped from insulating, from installing into homes uh, in the near future. And the direction of travel is very much towards air source heat pumps and electric heating. Um, some people may say hydrogen mm, uh, may come along in five, ten years' time. I think probably quite doubtful at the moment, the technology is not there, but definitely the technology is there for air source heat pumps. And as you can see uh, on the right hand side there, even in the next few years, if you're doing a house extension, um, you're going to have to uh, look at that differently than now, in terms of the radiator sizes, your insulating, and even if you're putting a small extension on your house, you're going to have to make some changes. So the direction of travel through building regulations and the government uh, sort of forcing the issue is very much towards electric. <clears throat> right. I had a conversation. I was on um, I'm with Octopus as a, as a uh, sort of energy <laughs> supplier. Um, and I was on last year, finished in March this year, their fixed price deal. Um, and it shot up, uh, probably by about 60%. So I rang them up and I said, you're 100% um, or supposed to be 100% green energy. Why is my bill shooting up 60%? So I just want to take you through the story I got back from them and, and what's going on. So just, you probably all know this, but I thought I'd start from this perspective. Um, you mean obviously we've got a number of generators, it's wind, it's solar, it, it's gas-fired power stations or other types of uh, generating. Um, goes in all that electricity when it's generated, goes in the network, suppliers, and there's more suppliers that are listed there, um, buy it, and it ends up coming to our home. And uh, October, quarter four last year, that's how much, in essence, we've generated by the different technologies. Gas, 35%, wind, solar, 27, and you can see the rest. Um, and again, that goes into the network, and then Ofgem <coughs> calculates the, uh, in essence, the tariffs, which we all seem to be uh, pretty following nowadays. Um, and you can see the, how that's broken down. 
Mainly, the biggest cost, wholesale cost of fuel, well, fuel in terms of energy, electricity, network costs, operating costs, VAT. We're obviously paying ourselves for um, making the UK more greener in terms of £153, and then you can see the rest in terms of profits. Where the system is wrong is gas. Uh, and everybody in you know, the papers have talked about it, but it's really uh, the issue at the moment. Because Ofgem calculates the uh, price for electricity based on the highest uh, generating cost. Doesn't look at uh, the other aspects in terms of wind, solar, nuclear. It takes the highest price of generating electricity, which is gas. The cost to wind uh, is about a quarter of the cost to generate the kilowatt hour than it is to buy gas, or to generate biogas. Nuclear is about half. So it's an awful lot cheaper generating electricity by wind, solar, nuclear, and other aspects. But because the way it's set up in terms of calculating the price, it takes gas. And you can see, I've just charted this, the cost per therm over the last sort of starts in 2017 has typically been 50 pence per therm in terms of gas. But you can see over the last couple of years how things have changed. And last week, because again the Russian situation, uh, the price shot up again to 2.45 pence. So it's all over the place. But Friday, I had to read in the Times that the government are finally considering doing something about it in their uh, review this coming autumn. So we may see it change. And hopefully, if that is the case, then the cost of our electricity will, will drop down. Because there's no doubt the government are pushing it towards um, renewables. And therefore, they're much cheaper than, than gas. Any questions? If not, I'll move on. Have they set the price, uh, have Ofgem set the price of um, energy against gas because gas is the biggest unit of. No, it's the most. They said it against what they call multiple pricing or something. They have this technical term. But it, it in essence, is the most expensive uh, technology to generate the kilowatt hour, is what they use. Okay. It's not but I'm sure it's more complicated. 35% against. Uh, so yeah, 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 obviously we are using more gas, yes. <coughs> but, but it happens to be that we're using the most, the most expensive. Um, we're actually supposed to be swimming in gas from the North Sea. And I realise we don't have very much in the way of storage, but why are we still subject to the market prices in the world? Because, of, well, everybody in the world is in some way subject to the economics of supply and demand. Uh, with the Russian situation at the moment, the supply has dropped. Uh, so we're all, open, in essence, open to the marketplace. And one problem the UK has, as I've said there, is we have 7% of our annual usage as storage, which is very little. Most of Europe has over 25%. So they can, in essence, swing a little bit in terms of the, when they buy gas. Again, the government are considering reopening one of the big storage places off the North Sea somewhere. I understood that we only took about 3% of our gas from Russia. Uh, yeah, but we buy, we have to buy liquefied gas from the Middle East, and that's obviously in demand now. Uh, we buy gas from Norway, there's an awful lot of gas comes from Norway, and again, it's a bit like, um, you know, somebody goes to Norway and says, we'll, we'll give you a pound for, for, for a third. <coughs> We'll give, in the UK said we'll give you 50p, you know what I mean, they're going to sell it to the highest bid, unless it's a long term contract. But, but, but yeah, it's a global issue. Mm. Of course, for Europe, it's trying to stock up on its gas yes. during the summer. Isn't yes. It? So that when the winter comes, yes. they will be able to somehow get through the winter. And they've got more storage than the gas. Right, if there's nothing else, we'll move on.
I don't know whether my is my voice loud enough without the microphone. No. I, I should have asked actually because my voice probably booms around. <coughs> Is that better? Yes. Yeah. 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 Somebody was listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I know most of the people in the room, but there are a few that I don't know. Um, I live locally and I'm an architect, um, and my day job is just dealing with resident, you know, residential architecture and people's houses. And I have to say that you know, it used to be you know, doing lovely extensions and all sorts of things, and now the focus has moved much more towards a whole um, overview of the whole house and looking at how the house is performing in the face of all the challenges of how much it's costing to heat, plus the corollary, which is the regulations are getting more and more and more onerous in order that we save heat. Um, so this it's a, now a new term, it's kind of buzzword, which is called retrofitting, but it's my bread and butter, basically. So, apologies if it gets a bit boring, but a lot of people ask me lots of questions, and I thought the easiest thing to do is to just fill a load of slides up, and hopefully you'll get from it what you need to get. Um, but I'm going to, well, first thing is pretty evident, but whether you need to save energy depends very much on your the ability to pay the bills that you currently got, and there are obviously a lot of people struggling. They may be not able to spend money on expensive retrofit, so there's a difficult situation. So everybody's going to be different. Everybody will have different takeaways from the things on offer. Some things are very cheap and uh, easy to do. Other deep retrofit stuff is expensive, and you would really only undertake it if you were you know, redoing your house, basically. Um, but you know, we have to accept that you know, people's ability to pay or whatever varies massively. And also the condition of the house that they're living in will vary massively in this village and throughout the country. <coughs> um, but I'm going to start with a few kind of behavioural things rather than actual infrastructure stuff. And apologies if this is kind of teaching a way to suck eggs or whatever they say. Uh, quick and easy things to do with your behaviour um, in order to save more bills, if bills are a real issue for you. So the first thing is, you know, how low can you set yourself to that? Um, and everyone has different uh, yeah, opinions on this, but the um, climate change recommended setting is 19 degrees, which might be a bit lower than some people are prepared to tolerate. Uh, it might be higher than other people are managing to live with. Uh, but the easiest thing to do is to just keep notching it down until you work out whether you're comfortable. Obviously, if you're old or don't live around much, your capacity to tolerate that will be quite different. Um, the next thing to do is you don't need to heat until you've gone to bed. You can turn, you can turn your heating off a good hour before you go to bed or an hour before you leave for work in the morning. And the house will maintain its temperature. So you can start trying to kind of snip and trim your settings in order to save money. Uh, for those who don't have them or don't know about them, you can put valves on individual radiators rather than just rely on a whole house service app, which means that each room is, or each radiator is separately controlled. If you've got a room that you don't use very often, like a spare room, you can notch it right down, shut the door, keep it on a kind of low level, but not waste heat, heating your whole house. So, these are kind of cheap things to do to your house to save some energy and money and the planet, basically. <laughs> um, there's been quite a lot of stuff in the press about keep the heating in the house. Uh, that doesn't mean reduce the temperature to a point where you might get damp or mold or anything, but maybe you can change your behaviour to have a lower temperature generally and feel more comfortable by doing other things like hot, hot water bottles or electric throws are the kind of buzzword, but they really don't cost very much to run. And you know, you can keep warm in winter and have the ambient temperature in the room quite a bit lower. Um, and then the obvious thing, again, you know, probably preaching to the converted, but plug the graphs because it really does drive heat loss. 
Um, so draft excluders on windows and doors, sausages on your front door, thick curtains against behind your front door. And if you do have an open fire, that is literally like leaving a window open if you don't um, properly seal it when it's not in use. And obviously not while it's in use. Um, but you can get a thing called a chimney balloon or a chimney sheep, which is made of lamb's wool, uh, and plug for that. Because, you know, as I say, it's just like you left a window open for 24-7 if you don't pay attention to that. Um, and these are just some provocative numbers to think about. Uh, I'm not particularly a numbers person, and you'll discover that Paul is a numbers person and I'm the general principle person. Um, but on the far left are the amount of energy that leaving things on standby can consume in a year, going from the hungriest things down to the leanest things. But it's something to remember, you know, if you don't switch off your telly from standby, or your game console, or various things, um, you could be just wasting energy. Um, in the middle is just an understanding of how much a shower costs these days. <laughs> um, what you do with that information is up to you, but uh, you know, it's the equivalent of you know, boiling your kettle 22 times, um, running down things, but you know, the equivalent of £1.50 per shower for an eight minute shower. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about cooking because that's what Ian will talk about later, but another obvious, if you don't know already, and I'm sure you probably do, um, there's been changes in regulation, but swapping to, switching to LED bulbs give you a massive saving. Uh, and they last for 10, 15 years, supposedly. Their prices come right down. Um, incandescent bulbs have already been discontinued, but you can't. You know, people still are buying halogens and they, they, there's no need. You don't separately, halogens are better than incandescent, but there's no need to buy halogens. You can get really good, powerful LED bulbs with the same fit, back fitting as a halogen. So you can retrofit and save a lot of money uh, over the year. Um, now I'm going to go on to houses. Uh, and I think the thing, this is just me doing a quick kind of trip around the village and seeing what kind of housing stock we all live in. Um, there's fewer of a certain type, there's fewer of the first type, but there are some like this. Um, more of the Victorian or kind of Georgian type, which tend to be solid. So the first type would be a timber framed house, thatched, sometimes, sometimes not thatched. Um, and that would be filled with bottle and door between the, between the timber stars. The next type, type in terms of age is solid bricks, so, and that means a, a nine inch wall, a, a brick link face. Um, pretty cold. Uh, the next kind would be typically an interwar house or a bit before, and again, usually solid brick but rendered, which gives you more opportunities to insulate it. And finally, from the 60s onwards, some earlier, but you will get a cavity built house. Um, and a cavity house is two strips of brick or block masonry with a gap in between. Originally, they weren't even insulated in the gap, then they've become insulated in that gap, and gradually the gap is but now, if we build one, the gap has got to be the gap has got to be six inches plus the two walls. So we're now talking about walls about this thick to build as per the regulations. Um, so you, you've got to know your house and what, you know, if, if you're interested in reducing bills and you want to know the practicality of it, you have to know the construction of your house and what its opportunities and risks are in order to kind of get going on them. But you, know, you really just need to make yourself a tea cosy if you're going to keep your bills down. So first thing to say, I, I've started with the, the place where it's the easiest win and the cheapest win uh, because usually most people's attic is uninhabited. Not in a house like that one there where you've got attic rooms, although that's thatched and it would be naturally very insulating anyway. Um, but if you have an uninhabited attic, um, chances are, well, if you're, if you're on the ball, you will have a good foot of insulation up there. If 
you're not, and you haven't kind of kept up with regulations, most people have four inches, which is between the seam of joists, because you put some board over it and you store it on it, and it's just squashed in between. And that's, it needs to be three times as high as that to meet current regulations or to be you know, worth having. Um, so these days, quite often I'm insulating attics and then putting raised storage platforms. So you can use systems or you can get the carpenters to make it, but you make a raised platform and then you would fill the gap underneath with more insulation. But you're not, you just mustn't squash it. So that is the cheapest and a DIY thing you can do. And a lot of your heat would go out of the non-insulated. Yeah. The, um, this foam that they put now underneath the roof, yeah. between the rafters, is, is that as effective as doing uh, It's more effective. What I'll say is, if you've got different kinds of roof, um, so, and I'll come on to foam. So the top one is if you've got an old attic like that first thatch cottage uh, and you're doing it up, you can um, put wood fibre insulation and plaster it with lime plaster. And that's a you know, traditional, breathable way of doing it. You can pass list building consensus stuff if they allow you to take off the lap of plaster. So that, that would be your approach if you've got an old cottage with rooms in the roof. If you're, and this is a Victorian house in Cambridge I'm just doing, and you, you do put that rigid foam between, and then more rigid foam in the plasterboard. And the rigid foam is a lot more efficient than rock ball, which is the quilted stuff, by a good factor. So you only need kind of this much of the rigid foam compared to this much of the rock ball. And the wood fibre is going to be somewhere in between. Um, so that's roofs, different kinds of roofs that you might have to tackle. But you know, the, the bottom one is, you know, these, these are clearly building jobs, not just your DIY job of an attic. Um, walls, um, again, you know, you can use mathematic heat through walls. If you've got, um, I'm going you know, kind of through the ages of houses here, so timber frame, you can add wood fibre and lime plaster, and I've got some samples of things over there, so, um, <coughs> Again, you need a specialist builder to do that. Oh, the, the slides further down are what I'm doing practically all the time that I tackle the Cambridge Terrace House, um, a typical Victorian house, which is to batten out the walls with vertical battens on that, of course, add three or four inches of rigid um, insulation with rigid, rigid foam. Which, uh, no, the next one, the thing, that, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, and then plasterboard it, and you have to bring all the electrics through and everything. So that again is quite a big task. But you know, if you were doing a, a house now, I would say even room by room, you should know insulation. And, you know, and you want to stay warm. That that's what we're doing as we look at houses. Um, if you're in a a uh, house with a cavity wall, it may have insulation in, you can get it blown in, you can get fibre or beaded insulation blown into your cavity. Um, that can degrade over years, so you can get it checked, check for leaks and stuff. But you can also additionally insulate on the inside with foam, and you wouldn't need so much because you've already got an airspace in the middle there. So you, know, you might be able to add this much insulation on the inside of that room, you you'd get a decent um, firm barrier. Uh, but that's what you do with a cavity wall. And then finally, if you have an interwar house which was rendered, and you might notice some of them in the village have had this done, some in Little Wall, some in Great Wall Room, where they wrap the whole house in polystyrene insulation or foam insulation, different foams, and they mesh and render it. And you have to be quite careful, you have to have a good overhanging roof so your wall doesn't get thicker than your roof. But that is a really good tea cozy and there's no disturbance inside, you're not dealing with electrics. So if you're lucky enough to live in a rendered house, that's, you know, that is a good way to uh, improve wall insulation. But it, and then it's a whole, it's a whole house solution. Um, windows, 25% um, of your heat might go through a single base window. Um, you 
really depends on your house, whether you know, if you've got, still got single place windows, are you a listed building or a little cottage or something? If you're not, you may be able to replace with double glazing or triple glazing. Um, but uh, if, you, if you can't do that, there are some other ways to tackle windows without actually purchasing new windows. Uh, I've put up there cheapest chips. What we all did in the 60s and 70s, probably in the last fuel crisis, was to stretch tin film across the inside. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one who lived in the house with clean film on the inside, but it does work um, to a certain extent. Uh, more sophisticated versions are uh, internal secondary glazing on magnets that you um, take up in the summer, but you get them fitted or you can get you know, they're, they're clear plastic uh, with magnetic strips that you can kind of seal to each window. Or you get more um, you know, more expensive and can be more elaborate with you know, for sliding sashes and things. Uh, there's a film called Clearview that the National Trust use uh, that will help. So, and the other thing which I did put on there is that if you do have historic uh, or small um, paned windows, you can now get something which is called histo glass, which is a, a double glazed unit, but it's very, very, very tiny gap, and you can get that glazed into an existing window. So, if you're allowed to do that, that's another option: is to double glaze. Again, it's not cheap, but, and there's a sample of it there, but it's, you know, you could glaze every little panel uh, in histo glass, which is sometimes accepted by the planners. So, sorry about this, this is all... <laughs> is there an optimal size for the gap between two glass sheets? Um, so the current standard is about 20 or 24 millimetres, and then after that they tend to go to triple glazing. Uh, and triple glazing... Uh, I can't remember what the uh, number is. I mean, it, it's better than double glazing. It is also much, in my experience from clients, much better than double glazing in keeping out overheating as well. So particularly if you've got uh, roof windows like Veluxes and stuff, mm. it's not usually much of an additional cost to buy a triple glazed version rather than a double glazed version when you put them in. The triple glazed version will really keep the heat out in the summer. So it, it's kind of working both ways. It's keeping the heat in in the winter, but it's also keeping the heat out from overheating in the summer. Um, and then floors. Uh, if you're on a solid floor, this is, like, this is a concrete floor, but if your house has solid floors, it depends <coughs> when it's been built as to whether it's been insulated. Probably 70s, 80s backwards, nobody bothered. <laughs> um, and then they started introducing layers of insulation. Um, and generally, unless you're building an extension, you don't normally dig it up and start again. But some people do. Uh, Ian, did you dig up yours and start again? Um, yes. <laughs> all sorts in there, but yeah, that's one of them, yes. Um, and then you would add, I mean, I typically add four inches of foam insulation into the sandwich that goes back. So you're digging right down in order to kind of put it all the layers of the cake back. On the other hand, you might be going in a Victorian cottage or something which has joisted floors and floorboards. And again, absolute standard part of the job is to lift all of those and insulate in between and put all the floorboards back and make it airtight. And that really will affect your comfort and improve your comfort in ground floor rooms, particularly the drafts through floorboards and joisted raised ground floors and so forth. Um, there are some, you know, if you can raise your floor level, you can put overlay systems in. But quite often people can't, you know, if you're converting a garage or something, you would put an overlay system in. But within an existing house, you can't necessarily afford to step up into a room. But, you know, that might be practical and you could do that. Um, and there are systems for that available where you would put timber or tiles on top of insulation on your existing floor. So, again. Uh, different options for different floors. Um, <coughs> so, if you know, I don't know how technical you found that. I was rattling through, but it's just trying to show you all the practical different ways that people can do things and what situations they may find themselves in. Um, and you know, your keenness to do it will depend on you know, your bills, your pop the, the depth of your pocket and whether you're doing some other associated works anyway. But if you're doing associated works, 
by now the building regs, which changed again last week, and they'll change again in two more years. They haven't changed for 10 years, and they finally just changed. Um, they're forcing you to uh, upgrade your existing house as well as doing new work. Um, so, um, you know, if you're contemplating anything, you're going to be forced to do lots of insulating. Um, hopefully, we're going to look into borrowing a thermal imaging camera next winter, so that if anybody's interested in that, we can use it to see where your home is leaking heat. Um, so that would be something we do. Um, there are, there's a kind of emergence on, on the left, there's, there's emergence of firms who are specialising in eco refurbs. So they're actually analysing houses with, with software and giving advice about how to deal with it. So for a, for a fee you can get some specialist advice, that's all they're doing. Um, otherwise it's usually a surveyor or an architect that's doing it as part of a general refurb. I think that's it for me at the moment. Are there any questions, by the way? <laughs> what, what sort of problems do you, when you pick a wall, whether you do it outside or whether you do it inside, yeah. your window reveals are much deeper. So how do you get over those sort of problems? You're like losing light? You're losing um, light. I think the really important thing to say is that you also need to insulate those. Even if you put just a little bit of insulation, because otherwise that's where the black mould comes. The mold will, the, if you've got a cold surface near the window and you've insulated the rest of the room, there'll be this strip of cold and the water, the vapour will just jump straight to that. So you do have to send, you, know, you do have to come and put a, a plank of thin insulation around your window. Just generally have a deep windowsill, you know, just extend the windowsill. And, uh, yeah, that's what people do. The other, the other problem I always fear is that many houses, um, over the, you know, 50 years ago uh, and then back. Yeah. Have um, timber floors, timber joists on the ground floor, yeah. and you have um, air bricks underneath. Yeah, you've got to keep that to, all ventilated. Yeah. You, to keep it ventilated, to keep um, yeah. damp out. Yeah. So if you were doing what I had a picture of, you've absolutely got to make sure that your underfloor ventilation is maintained. And you're just putting a kind of layer, an airtight layer, to stop you interfacing with that ventilation, but the building can still ventilate. So it's important to keep it ventilated. Yeah, so if you're, if you're doing a joystick, you've got to keep it ventilated underneath. Uh, and sometimes when you're plugging an extension on the back of a house, I literally put drainage pipes through that solid floor extension in order to ventilate a joystick room, you know, two rooms back or something. Yes. And that's quite typical. Yeah. Um, so you, you've got your air bricks. And the other thing is, by doing all this um, insulation, you're, you're losing the natural ventilation within the house to the older properties. Yeah, I think if you're dealing with older properties, um, particularly thin frame, you want to, I mean, it's better to sort of tend towards the kind of wood fibre insulation that will breathe uh, and line plasters and stuff rather than modern cement plasters. With a cavity wall house or something, you don't have those issues, I don't think. I mean, you, you still want to do the layers all properly and you've got to know what you're doing. And it's not something, apart from the, the quilt of the loft, I wouldn't do any of this as a DIY job um, because there are certain procedures that you go through. Um, but I think, you know, mo you know, mostly it's all known about you know, wh which system to use for which construction and what the, and what the best methods are to avoid condensation, basically. What do you do about conservatories then? <laughs> they, well, the official line is you shouldn't have a house, so you shouldn't have a door between, you, shouldn't, you have to have a door between your conservatory and your house. You're never allowed to have a conservatory without a door. You've got to be able to shut it off, you've got to be able to shut off the heating and not use it for six months. That is the official building way to uh, They don't want you to just lose heat by heating the floor and so so you're still allowed to build them. I mean, that, that's been the rules for quite a long time. But people who take the doors off and who make them half of the, the room are doing so really good. Okay. Well, we could just go back to one of your earlier slides when you said we were going to push the move away from gas and water. Um, my uh, 
Uh, again, to touch the panels, micro crystalline. Uh, most of them are now are that, and that would be the one I would suggest you, you go for. But most manufacturers now, or providers of panels, will, will give you that. Um, you may need planning permission. Uh, we're a conservation area in the village. Um, I spoke to the planning officer when I did mine. Uh, we didn't see any issues. Probably issues will come if you're street facing. Uh, but then you have to go through a formal planning process. But it is permitted development in lots of instances. Uh, building regulations, again, you need to make sure the roof uh, can take the weight of the panels and also uplift. It's not just weight going down uh, onto a roof structure. You get wind going underneath the panels uh, and you get an uplift effect as well. So uh, you need to make sure through uh, calculations that roof structure can take that. And again, that's often done by the installers. When you contract for the panels, the installer will do all that, provided they're micro-generation certified. So my system, um, I bought my system in January last year, uh, so I've had it 18 months now. Um, I'm on a, uh, a westerly facing uh, roof, so not ideal. Uh, it's 47 degrees, so not quite ideal. Um, I've got uh, 15 Q cell panels, uh, actually, I think it should be 14 Q cell panels, 340 each. Uh, so the total install capacity is 4.76 kilowatt P. P, uh, you'll see kilowatt hours in an awful lot of instances. P means the maximum power the array will, will generate. Um, I started off with 7.2 uh, kilowatts of battery storage uh, and I went through last winter with that but about four months ago, three months ago I doubled that capacity uh, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, so I, battery storage is not cheap but I would definitely recommend it uh, if you're going to put solar panels in. Um, I also got a solar eye boost uh, which automatically transfers the spare electricity from the uh, system into my version <coughs> heater. So in summer months, uh, in fact probably even in March this year, we had such a sunny March and April, um, I switched my heating off and I was getting free um, electricity in terms of hot water. Uh, and I exported, uh, or I can't export, more than 3.68 kilowatts. So the other thing, uh, when you're putting an array in, you may get limited by the UK power network. Uh, so that means you can't export more than, in my case, 3.68 kVAs. Uh, and I suspect that's probably a lot of the cases in the village. Um, I purchased mine through the South Cambridge Solar Together scheme, um, which I again would recommend. I know a few of you in the village um, are also hopefully going to purchase through that arrangement. Year. I reckon um, mine were about 40 odd percent cheaper going through that bulk buying scheme. Um, it's easy to register on the South Cam's website. They run it uh, this year again, um, and the same company, Greenscape uh, Energy and Ipswich, have won the contract. I think last year when I was there, there was about 2,500 um, homes registered to, to join the scheme. This year it's over 8,000. So, big increase. Um, so, um, so, that's the system on the left. Uh, how I run it, and I have a sort of winter summer arrangement, uh, as I said earlier, I'm with Octopus. So, um, at the moment, um, Octopus, my fixed rates, I can draw electricity down between 12.30 and 4.30 at 7.5 pence a kilowatt. So as you can well imagine, in the winter months, I force my batteries to charge through the night and I can just about fill the batteries um, through that time period from 12.30 to 4.30. <coughs> so I'm charging them at 7.5 pence and running those batteries down in the day rather than taking electricity from the grid at 30 pence. Um, if I do need to take it, as I say, I have to pay 30.8 for it. In the summer months, typically April to October, um, the house is set to buy firstly uh, 
the <coughs> energy generated, the kilowatt hours generated, goes to the house, and whatever the house uses, it, it's supplied by the panels on a sunny day. Um, if um, there is spare capacity, i.e. the house is not drawing that amount of kilowatt hours, first it goes to the batteries and the batteries charge up. Then, uh, if the winds, the batteries are full, it goes to the eye boost and the immersion heats the hot water up and I get free um, the hot water. And if there's anything spare, it gets exported to the grid. And that's my least thing I want to do. But, but it does it, you know, typically in days like today, I'll be exporting about 8 kilowatts. And I get 4 pence just over. So, in 2021, last year, uh, remember it was probably 11 months, um, I generated 4,308 kilowatt hours. Uh, of that, that provided 77% of my own use. I exported 23% and imported 33%. This year so far, to the end of June, I've generated a very similar amount actually. 2,000 just over kilowatt hours. I've used 83% of that because I've made some adjustments to my settings, so I'm using more than I'm exporting. Uh, but I've still uh, exported 70% and I've imported 30%, 751. So in a year, I'm probably going to be importing 1,500 kilowatt hours. And in some ways, I'm not too worried about the electricity price. <coughs> So, here we go, savings, around 3,200 kilowatt hours, not imported, around, that equates to around 1,200 pounds. I've saved a little bit of oil, because that's fixed to the uh, oil around 150 kilowatts. And I estimate it's probably around about a 10 year payback period. So, it's, it's not a quick turnaround, but if you consider, if I had a pound in the bank, I could be getting half a percent of it. Getting a much bigger percent in terms of investing my money in terms of putting panels on than I have leaving the money in the bank. Paul, I think you're going to see what's Log bonus, when you make it to the studio? I do have a log bonus, as you probably well know. Uh, so I have a secondary heating if I need it for the winter months, yeah, I have a log bonus, but it doesn't fit into these equations. If you have a power cut, are you sitting happy or does the power cut? I mean, this village has a power cut, sorry. No, I'm sitting <laughs> until I use my 14 kilowatts, yeah. 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 <laughs> you ran the author. What's the life expectancy of your panels? Panels, they reckon the modern panel is 25, 30 years. Okay, so is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The inverter is, is the weak point in all of this because it's doing the most work. Uh, and probably, although you can get inverters which are guaranteed for 10, 20 years, but most, you know, seven to 10 years is a life expectancy. And it's about 1,200 pounds to replace them. What's the life expectancy of a battery for? Um, I don't know, actually. The modern ones, I have to say, mine are guaranteed for 10 years. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I think, <coughs> even though you lose efficiency, after yeah. 10 years, probably going to be about 85% efficient. Um, mine now at 98%. Um, and what's the structure of these batteries? Are they lithium ion? Lithium. They are. They're in the loft. Yeah, because they need to be cool, don't they? Uh, Coolish, yeah. yeah. You need airflow going around them, and I've got air bricks, good, so good. Yeah. Do, you know, do, you know, do you know of anyone who's got a heat pump? And the solar, solar panel battery arrangement. Yes, you can go and He's coming up later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, yes, there's a few in the middle. Yes. Did you want the question? Well, I'm just, I, I, I'm just curious to what extent one can run a heat pump off batteries. Oh, off batteries? Uh, no, you wouldn't. The demand from the oh, SOC pipe is too great for a battery. Yeah. So, do you have. Um, so they get radiators in the house, is that how you do it? No, no water. I, I, I have under floor heating downstairs, which is water, and radiators upstairs. 
but I have an old one. So your the electricity you generate through your uh, roof panels keeps the water to go around your underfloor system? No, 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 hot water only, in terms of some of them. Yes. Uh, but in the so what are you using this electricity for? How, how the you house, the house. So your radio is upstairs. No, 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 I just use it for the house. It's, it's the house, really. I just use it once the house. So, so the other three the lighting, lighting, transition, transition, yeah. TV, bridge, yeah. freezer, yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Or washing yeah. machine.
seven pounds. And the end of May, in May, 735 pounds in six months. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm looking along. Don't tell Bobby. Right. I'm trying to remember to stand here because my voice is not as good as Karen has calls. Um, I'm going to talk about e-comps, um, and you'll see that. I'm not the numbers person, I'm just the general principal person. <laughs> so I mean, we've gone through Paul's numbers. But then we're going to have Nick afterwards talking, he's going to talk about living with heat up and he'll, he'll give you more numbers. So I'm just going to do the general principal. Um, so, it's a couple of words on that, but uh, we're off the gas lid and we're obviously dependent on heating oil. We've had conversations about that and the way things are going. Uh, Government are inducing us to switch to electrically powered heating, and it's definitely a characteristic approach. So the building regulations are changing, and they're offering grants to help you afford a boiler replacement scheme. Um, the grant is uh, at the moment five thousand uh, pounds, and to, that came in in uh, April. It's now been zero rated for that, whereas it was five percent before, so that's a little bit better. Um, it, like solar, it was better before there was, a, there was a scheme where you got paid for how much energy you were saving. Now it's a flat rate and it doesn't contribute uh, a great deal to the cost of installing it. So the, cost, the installation costs are quite high. Um, but the difficulty is the writing is on the wall for oil, oil, oil boilers as far as I can tell from what people, experts have said. So you come to a point of having to make a decision about which way you're going to go if your boiler is about to need to be replaced. Um, so how do they work? In simple terms, and I'll, I'll keep it simple, uh, they're like a fridge in reverse. And nobody even really worries about how a fridge works, but it somehow makes a cold interior while your room is warm. Uh, the uh, SLC pump works in it exactly the opposite way. It takes latent heat out of the air, even if the air is relatively cold, and they work very well in Scandinavia when the temperatures go right down. Uh, and by compressing a um, the refrigerant and expanding it and compressing it, uh, they create heat and transfer that into your system in the house. Um, if electricity was cheaper, and we've just been discussing this, it would be a very efficient way to heat your house because they use a relatively small amount of energy to transfer heat, basically, rather than actually burning a fossil fuel to create heat. So if things get repriced and recalibrated as the country moves towards renewables, this will be a no-brainer. At the moment, it's, you know, it can be relatively expensive to run. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I think the, the main thing to say is that a heat pump sufficiency will absolutely depend on how well insulated your house is. So just like a fridge, how hard does that fridge have to work in high summer to create some ice inside? A heat pump has to work extremely hard and therefore use up lots of electricity if it's trying to heat an old and leaky house. So as always, your money is best spent on insulating first before you spend on the kit. Um, if you and there was a kind of perverse incentive with the previous um, grant scheme where you were allowed to hit, you know, install heat pumps in older houses which didn't have much insulation. Um, now, I think you, you have to prove that you've done the work insulating. I'm not quite sure, but you know, it, it, also because you don't get so much money, you will want to insulate. So there's a thing called a coefficient of performance, and that talks about how much, uh, you know, in terms of kilowatts, you put in um, in terms of energy and what you get out. Um, and you will always get an uplift, so it's not like an electric radiator where you put one kilowatt in and you get one kilowatt out. Um, there, will be, there will be some kind of uplift, but in a, for a well-insulated modern home, that might be three to four times the heat out compared to the energy you put in. In an uninsulated house, you might not get more than two. Um, so you want to put your money into insulating first. 
Um, the other thing to say about them is that they work at a lower temperature. The water temperature is lower than your standard boiler. So they're very suited to unsure heating like this room. You know, this hall is heated by a heat pump, which is just behind us here. Big surface area to heat at a low temperature warms everything up nicely. If your house is on radiators, you'll find uh, that uh, they, unless they're you know, already very ample, they're likely to be <coughs> need to be made bigger by about 25%. And the regulations changed last week, and now every bit of remedial work you do in your house, every radiator you change, you're obliged to oversize it by 25% in preparation for heat pump. So, that's, you know, the government is basically setting everybody up to be able to um, heat the homes. Um, I'd say that there is a massive challenge for the government and mainly town and city dwellers as to where to put them. Uh, and I think that's going to be what the cost of it and you know, really how you can tuck them into smaller houses and into city and street scapes and where they're not going to be a nuisance to people. We're luckier in a village that mostly we've got larger gardens and we don't have such tight, cheap by jar living. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they manage. Um, if you don't know, uh, Heat Pump has an outside unit which looks you know, not particularly pretty. They look a bit like what well, they are. They look like an air conditioning unit and they're a big fan. You have to not block it in because it works by drawing the heat in and blowing the cold air out. You can possibly put a trellis spaced away from it as long as you keep that very open, but you can't just kind of put some boarded fencing fence around it and expect it to work. Um, it's best positioned backing onto your house uh, if you can, because then you don't, you're not digging and having to insulate it, you know, have insulated pipes on the ground. Um, and that will get you direct with your pipes as close as possible up to your hot water cylinder. Um, but I am fitting them at distances from people's houses and having insulated pipe work because you know, there isn't a location right by the house or you're near a neighbour and you don't want to cause um, nuisance from the noise. Um, so, in terms of planning missions, they are they're counted as permitted development. Uh, that means that you can fit them without applying for permission. If they're a small size, which is under six cubic meters, which is the, the normal smaller one, if, you need a if you've got a very large house which requires double ones, you won't fit in with that permitted development. They've got to be more than a meter away from your boundary to your neighbours for noise reasons. Uh, and in conservation areas, they shouldn't face the street or be between the house and the street. And on listed buildings, there's no permissive development. Um, I've found in installations that I've done in the Little Wilbur for David Humphrey and ones in the city, um, I want to be closer to the boundary than a metre because it's a small garden. You don't want something stuck out halfway into the garden. Um, you can do a sand calculation and work out how far away from the house and how far away from your neighbour based on habitable rooms and walls and all sorts of things, bouncing the sand around, but you can do a calculation and prove, oh, okay, I can have it close to the boundary, but it's going to be four metres away from my house, and that shouldn't cause, well, it will cause some noise, but that's the level that the government considers as no nuisance to your neighbour. So, there's a whole load of practicalities in terms of sighting it outside, but hopefully in the villages we can fit them in, if that's what people want to do. Um, inside, Again, it depends on the size of your house, but they take quite a lot of room. Um, you know, I, I don't know about all the houses here, but particularly in the city, a lot of people have um, ripped out their old air covers because they have comedy boilers and they've taken up the space. But actually, you know, in order to have a heat pump, you've got, you've got to have a hot water cylinder um, and store hot water, and you have buffer tanks and you have the internal control unit and you have a head of tanks as well. So it can look like a plant room or a ship's boiler or something. It really is a dense set of piping. That's in a small cupboard. This is in the Humphreys house in Little Wilbur, um, where you had a bit more space. But 
it is quite a large installation. And again, I think that's going to be the challenge for people in smaller houses. You can, I haven't done them, I'm sure you can do it, you can get horizontal cylinders and put them in your lot. So I would assume that there are similar heat pump horizontal cylinders, but I haven't actually tried to do that yet. But those are the challenges. Um, and I think we're going over to Nick. I mean, has anyone got any questions? Starts up in the winter. You don't hear your own air source heat pump because it's outside. Your neighbours might if they're out putting stuff in their bins. Um, in the summer, you're sitting out in the garden, and for some reason, it starts up to top up your hot water. You hear it start to whine a little bit. It's not annoying, but I notice it every time it does it. And I think, why am I spending money on that? Why is that running? Uh, you're like that. But I wouldn't say it's a, a major problem. If it was next to your, your neighbour's sitting room window and they wanted the window open in the summer, they would be aware of it. Once you haven't got that sense in there. But I wouldn't say it was a disaster. Um, so am I pressing the right button here, Paul? Um, yeah. Okay. I might not be the best person to give this at the talk because. I always have an air source heat pump when I'm in this ha in this village. There are in this house anyway. There are people here who've converted from something else to an air source heat pump. I may live in this modern house, uh, which, is, as far as I can tell, heavily insulated and therefore efficient. It's not quite a tea cozy, I wouldn't say, but it's it's well insulated. It's semi detached. That's helpful because that's my neighbour is keeping one one side of my house warm. Um, it, we're all electric, so um, that's different from Paul. Uh, built from the very start, we asked the builder to put in air source heat pump. Uh, the builders were thinking of putting oil, I think, in the six houses in Chapel Meadows. Uh, but I had read about air source and thought this sounded like a good plan, particularly if the builder was going to pay for it, uh, which he did. Uh, and so we've been generally happy with it ever uh, since. My wife's in the room and she's not screaming at me. So. Um, we've also had these solar panels, but I'm not really here to talk about that. But we, we, we have both systems uh, and we manage to sort of interface them perfectly well. So moving swiftly on, as they say, because what you really want to do is Ian come and talk and do a bit of cooking, don't you? Um, here's my unit. I've shown you for scale one of my um, uh, water uh, storage things there, so you can see how big it is. It does blow out cold air. I'd say when you're in the garden, the cold air, if you wanted to be anywhere near it, is more annoying than the whining because it is cold. That's the whole point of it. Um, and so, and, and you've got to let it get out, otherwise it recirculates and it's drawing in the back um, even colder than it otherwise would be. Um, and I've mentioned the noise, but I, I don't think it's really a problem unless you're hypersensitive. Um, Emma's just talked about the pipe work. We have an airing cupboard. Believe it or not, that is our airing cupboard. I've taken out the, the um, racking of timber shelves, which is quite tricky, <laughs> to show you all the pipe work. Um, the builder said himself, what you really need is a plant room <laughs> to put this in but he couldn't fit it into the, into the house. And so we've got the, the cylinder on the, on the right there, loads of pipes and things. I don't know how it works. Don't ask me anything too technical. Um, but you can see there's a couple of valves which occasionally I'm supposed to look at to make sure they're not leaking. Uh, we have it serviced once a year, uh, just like having your oil or gas central heating uh, serviced. Um, you'll see that in a minute, that you run an air source heat pump in principle all the time, by which I mean you don't turn your central heating off at night. Therefore, it will be doing some pumping in the night, and if you're a light sleeper, as I am, I sometimes hear the pump start up that's moving water round my radiators upstairs. I should have said my system is, like Paul's, a wet system, 
We have underfloor uh, heating downstairs and a radiator system upstairs with the larger radiators that Emma told you about. They're not huge, but they're bigger than you might otherwise have expected. And there's a bit more kit in the loft, but I don't worry about that, obviously. Um, uh, oh, poor photograph perhaps, but this is close up in, in the airing cupboard. I don't know what goes on in the box of truth about Samsung, because I've never seen the lid taken off it. The important bit is the vertical that is just to the right of it, which is the heat exchanger, because Emma didn't actually say, or maybe it was on the side, that what happens is the air source heat up outside heats water which close to, but doesn't join up to, the water in your central heating system. The heat, the heated water from outside goes into that heat exchanger and comes very close to another sealed system of water inside your house. And the water, remember, what is it, heat always goes from a hot, a cold, heat of hot. Heat goes from a hotter body to a colder body, so the heat passes from the sealed outdoor system into the sealed indoor system. Does that make sense? And that's what that piece of kit there, the vertical bit, does. That's really the only reason I've shown you that slide. Um, the other bit, if you have underfloor heating, uh, and in my case we have uh, a system whereby each room has a radiant, has a thermostat on the wall, so that you can set a different temperature in different rooms downstairs. So in our case, the kitchen and the sitting room are the warmest. The utility room is pretty cold. My wife gets cross about that because she sometimes wants to dry clothes in the, in the utility room. Um, so but you can do all of that. And so each room has its own individual circuit of water, and each of those is controlled by one of those valves, and that's hidden in a cupboard under the stairs. I'll get a panel on the front of the blanket off so we don't look at it. Um, so I've said everything that's mentioned there. That's a typical radiator upstairs. Um, so I, well, yeah, I can't tell you exactly how big it is, but you can see it's about the size of the window. You may have radiators like that already, but that is an oversized radiator. And we've got thermostatic uh, valves on the radiators upstairs. We don't have individual thermostats on the wall, we just have a one thermostat on the landing, and then you can control the radiators. We've got a spare room which we generally don't heat at all, except if somebody's coming to stay. Uh, so you can do all of that kind of thing. So what's it like living in it? So what's different? If you've got an oil system now, you know that if you turn it on, something will happen quite quickly and you probably have it on from, say, half past six in the morning in the winter, and you turn it off if you're going to be out of work, or you turn it down if you're going to be out of work, you have it come up to another temperature when you come home, and you turn it off uh, on your timer thing at maybe half past ten or wherever uh, at night, because you know that in the morning it'll kick in, and by the time you get out of bed and want to walk to the bathroom, well, it won't be cold. And in the holidays, you probably turn it off uh, completely, the heating system that is, and, in this, uh, 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 and uh, maybe you use your boiler to give you hot water. So it's somewhere off except perhaps the hot water. So if you've got an air source heat pump, the first thing you learn is that it doesn't do anything quickly. <laughs> it's expensive in terms of electricity to build up the temperature from a low position. It works hard. And it does whine a lot, I imagine, and we don't do that. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. You change your mindset and think, I'm going to run the system in the winter months at least all the time, 24 hours a day, controlled by your thermostats. Okay? So the idea, in principle, is to keep the temperature constant all day and all night. You can reduce it a little bit at night. The installers tell you that you could perhaps reduce the overall temperature by one degree or two degrees maximum. Any more than that, it will cost you a fortune to get that back in the morning. And indeed, it may not recover the two degrees until mid-afternoon. It's as, in it, it is, it's as slow and cumbersome as that. So the secret is not to change the thermostats. Um, uh, in the summer, um, we use our system 
to heat hot water. Uh, we don't have one of these eye boost things with our solar panels. We use the air source, um, but we just stop it pumping water around the house by putting the thermostats down to frost setting or something. So we run it, as I've said there, for hot water. When we go on holiday, um, I don't turn it all off. Again, the installers say you'll regret that bitterly unless you've got some clever system where you can turn it on again the day before you come back from your skiing holiday because it'd be flipping cold if you've turned it all off. So you keep it on. You can get smart systems. Well, I expect you can. Which you can yeah. turn on yeah. Your yeah. yeah. So, in principle, we leave it capable of running on its thermostats while we're not there. And in, in the, uh, so far as hot water, you can say, well, let's have a house hot, but I don't need any hot water and I'll heat the hot water, I'll turn the hot water on when I come back from holiday. Again, the installers will tell you, and I think my experience is that you don't do that. You turn the hot water down so that it's at a lower operating temperature, but you don't turn it right off because, again, it's got to work like crazy to get from, I don't know, 12 degrees to 55 degrees or so, which is the normal running temperature of our system. So, I said here, you know, how much can you save compared with oil or gas when running an air source heat pump? My answer at the moment is, is not a lot. Um, Emma mentioned this coefficient of performance, which the man manufacturers will tell you is incredible. It tells you that if you buy one kilowatt of electricity, you can get up to four kilowatts of heat out of it, which sounds unbelievable. In my experience, it is unbelievable. It doesn't happen. Um, but it's the fit, what would affect it would be the type of house you've got, in other words, how insulated it is. I suppose one of the first and second points are the same thing. The external air temperature, although they use them in Sweden and places like that, if the outside air temperature is minus two, it's going to take more power to get it up to, the, to, to heat the water you want than if the outside temperature is plus 15. That's, that's common sense, isn't it? Um, so that can affect it. Um, and the way in which you then use the air source, if you've got just radiators because you're in an existing house and you can't afford to rip the floor up, well, you're not going to have underfloor heating probably. And the final thing is, yes, the operating temperature of the water. Um, ours is set at 55 degrees. Um, Paul is in contact with a very clever lady who does all sorts of experiments on her system and has tried reducing the temperature of the house overnight by more than two degrees and she's tried reducing the temperature of her water uh, by several degrees and to see whether the saving that can be achieved by not running it at night like that is exceeded by the cost of the extra electricity in getting back to the real temperature in the, in the mornings. From what I read of what she said, you don't gain much at all, and it's not worth the thing. Uh, so I wouldn't think about it. So I've said there, I don't really know how much we save because I didn't have an oil system before in this house. We only ever had air cells. But Ofgen tell you that in a typical three-bedroom house, for where, by which they mean when, where there is two or three people living there, the average consumption of an average house, and Emma's told you there isn't such a thing as an average house, is about 15,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours of power. Um, we've used, as you can see here, much less over the last two years. This is total power, this includes my solar. I haven't actually bought that much power because we've got solar panels which have produced about 36% of my total energy requirement over the last two years. I'm probably talking too fast, but if you average that out, it looks as if I'm using about average of 8,000 kilowatt hours of power from one source or another to keep my house warm uh, and to have as many showers as I want. So that, that's the sort of size of it. Um, I, if you did the sums at the moment on average prices of electricity and average prices of gas, and average prices of oil, uh, 
without going into all of it because something I'm not that good at the figures, I think that an air source heat pump would cost as much as either of those systems and possibly even a little bit more. But, but, uh, you can, if, if you remember Economy 7, uh, which I think you can even, I think you can still get, well, the current popular equivalent is Octopus Go, it's called, which Paul has and which I have. That gives you cheap electricity at night. Paul told you he pays 7.5p at night and about 30p or so in the day. Well, with the air source heat pump, clearly all the power you're using at night is at the cheap rate. Okay? And if you add a battery, then even if you haven't got solar panels, if you add a battery, you can store more of that cheap electricity at night and that will help you during the day. So, with those uh, factors, that what's called time of use power supply, T-O-U, that's right, that's another buzz and uh, phrase you're going to hear more of, I think, in, in coming years. Time of use charging, pricing. Uh, that makes this system work for us. Uh, we didn't have any choice, well, we did have a choice because we told the builder to put it in, I suppose, but now we've got it, we, we're living with it, and we're happy with it. I think in my experience, well, David Humphrey, who I checked with, said he's, he's had a whole extension built. He was on oil, and now he's on air source. And he says he's heating more area for a bit less than he was with oil, but not massively less. So he, he's got an improvement, but it's not yeah. an exponential improvement, but right. he has got the benefit. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've gaveled that you. Did anybody like to ask any questions before I slip off and watch you? Nick, can I just ask? Um, the people who get the, the heat incentive, the RHIs? No. Oh, okay. That's been replaced with the straight 5k grant to replace the boiler. Oh, okay. So there's no payment to turn on. Because we were getting about 450 a year, I think. Well, so, seven years is gone now, so we don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't quite sure. Are you talking about the, um, the annual payment grant? Uh, that's gone. That's gone. That's gone. That's gone. Yeah. I was going to say something else uh, about the benefits of it. Uh, if you are more on the elderly side and are working at home uh, or living at home all the time, of course, the fact you've got that all the time means that you're not you're getting that dip at 2 o'clock when, when the house drops. So we find that it's much more uh, comfortable and livable at 90 degrees. Uh, I just wanted to pick up um, Emma's point. Um, where she said you can't box it in. In fact, you can buy boxes with louvers on it. Right. Um, I'm not, they are sold specifically for that purpose. Uh, yeah, I mean, and if you're in a listed building, you might be required to have it. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it does reduce the efficiency or not. You're advised not to box it in. Maybe there are products out there and you would have to check. They're, they're, they're yeah. louvers. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. You've got to keep it. the airflow. It may seem a trivial point, but it doesn't smell as well. Whereas with the oil, when the neighbour sweeps it on their oil, you can smell it all. All right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Gentlemen, there. We, we, we also have one of these. I just want to say that the, uh, with, with a lot of experiment, a lot of experiments in terms of playing around water temperature and time of it coming on, we, we have we have managed to get really quite a significant saving out of it relative to, to oil. But it did feel an awful lot like that was uh, iterative trial and improvement. It's very loud that you sort of have to teach yourself to become a heating engineer. Um, <laughs> uh, and, it, and I felt that it, I felt with the whole process that I might just have been the store that we had, that it was a remarkably un perhaps an unsupported process. Here, here is a new, we can get the guidance that you got, for example, we've just got given it. And that's what's really driven the, the experimentation. Uh, now ultimately, that's over the course of about two years, has come out with a good outcome. But I think that um, mm. it's, it is completely different and it's not, you are somewhat, we were somewhat cast adrift with this thing and uh, uh, expected to come up with a way of making it work for us. Tom, how do you, how do you the system then? 
Oh, we, we, we run it, I mean, we, remember, we never got any of this guidance, but we, we, we run it very differently from that. Yeah. So it is, um, uh, it's off completely during the night. Um, it, we only run it during the day when the temperature is, is hotter. Um, this, this is during the winter rather than during the, mm. during the summer. Mm. Um, we, had, we, heat, we had previous owners installed very, very large radiators in our house anyway, so we didn't have to have radiators retrofitted, but, the, um, uh, but we run the water through the radiators, it's remarkably cold, 35, 40 degrees, but again, all, all day, during the day, and the hot water, as you said, 50, 55 degrees, mm. but it only heats during the winter from about dawn until dusk to take advantage of the warmer okay. air that is on pretty much continuously. Mm -hmm. and from that, we use about Last year we used about 4,400 kilowatt hours, something like that. Um, so I mean, you can get really quite significant savings from it, but it was. I'm still asking you to come around my house. I think. It was, <laughs> as I say, it's very much, it's very, very much trial and proven. We also have to say, I would not recommend our installer. So what kind of house are you in? Is it a new house? We're opposite. What? That's for John's opposite. Oh, I think. I think. I think Oh, is it one the only one you oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, yeah. But it's so it's a, it's it's a it's a it's a bungalow. I'm, you may be able to correct me. It's a bungalow. I think it's comfortable, insulated, yeah. and <laughs> it's um, it's got fairly good insulation. It's double glazing. I see. I just keep checking. <laughs> yeah, sort of aluminium frame, double glazing yeah. windows and things like that. But it's um, so just if it goes off at you know five o'clock in the winter. What do you do at 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock? Well, <laughs> put a jumper on. Put a jumper on. I mean, the, the house retains heat incredibly. You know, so that it goes off at, say, 6 o'clock, and the house still has, still has heat. Still has heat. We do have a log burner in the sitting room. Um, but it, uh, and then it clicks on at sort of 5 or 6 a.m. or 6 or 6 a.m. in the winter, and I sit down. Yeah. yeah. The final thing I say is our installer, the plumber, who worked for the builder, refused to service my system. Uh, we've never seen him since the day we moved in. We had to find somebody else. So that shows they didn't know what they were doing, perhaps. And this I felt was quite, yeah. So it all felt a bit sort of, yeah. One thing I would say, so we have a system that we But, but it comes from a log burner rather than the... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I 
at a previous meeting, we discussed something mentioned, but the Swatham Prior, yes. I think, or Swatham Wilbeck, which was the Swatham Prior. Anyway, they were having an experiment with the yeah. uh, crowdsourced beef pot. I wonder if there was any feedback of that. Is it working? Uh, I don't think it's working yet, so I understand it. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not, it's not, not shot. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it done? No, no, it's not, not, no, it's not, it's not operations. So they've dug the trenches and made oh, the engines, but they've not actually started. Them. Not really started. Yeah. Okay. One, one last question then. Mark, because I asked Mark, he's converted from oil to, I'm going to put it in the spot now. Oil to, uh, yeah, what, what's your view? Uh, we're very happy. So we have the oil and oil is packing up. We just pulled uh, it the uh, source of Pressure water and the other one take to that so all the water off the roof of the garden. Uh, yeah, we're, we're very pleased with the way it runs physically because we're really getting used to. And uh, last year, in the last year we've had uh, 16 solar panels to do. So we're just getting together through the year now, trying to get the right combination. We haven't had a week to build them both together. But I would say, looking at the price of oil the last time online, I wanted to fill up my did you do a lot of uh, insulation of the house, Mark? Uh, since we've been there over the years, we've been there, we've had cabinet insulation. Uh, the roof was insulated to uh, more than the 300 millimeters I've ever mentioned because I wouldn't think construction now, I used to get the surplus like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we've got double glazing windows and it's good as you can get. Okay, well, you won't be waiting for the highlight of the evening, so, so it's uh, over to Ian. Now. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to have Actually, I've got a question just for us to move this yeah, over. Okay, yeah. um, so, Emma, you know our house. Um, I've got economy, well, I'm on economy 10, which is like a sort of a longer version of economy 7, as you probably guess. Should I be getting a big battery in my place? So I can charge it during the Night time. But you're using your yeah. But then just for powering the house for general stuff, I mean is that the way talk to Paul about it because I don't yeah. yeah, no, just sort of Paul's you, you, you probably need to do it think you need to we don't let charge yeah. yeah. I mean yeah, I mean, my house is, I'm sure probably most of you know, is over there and is a very old timber frame house and is a complete disaster zone in terms of its sort of environmental, um, you know, keeping in the heat and everything. We've done everything we, we can do to it, basically. I think uh, sort of much of it wasn't insulated. The, the gaps in the windows when we moved in were something else. Um, but uh, it's, it's okay now, but I think probably quite a lot of you would have seen me walking around village in my British Antarctic survey over bright orange overalls looking like I've escaped from Guantanamo. But the reason why I wear that all the time is because it's always jolly coloured in there. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's interesting sort of from hearing everyone's experiences about trying to keep heat in into the houses. And I guess I'm kind of trying to do a similar thing with cooking really. Um, so um, this picture will make more sense in a moment. Um, but um, yeah, reducing the carbon, cook, uh, carbon footprint in the kitchen. Um, and basically I put it the two sort of essential ways of doing that and it's heat and meat really. Um, I'm not going to get, get on to the side of sort of dietary changes um, and what we all can do in terms of that. Um, so I'm principally going to talk about sort of heat and how we can sort of sort of clever little ways of, um, of saving um, heat around the kitchen. Um, kettle fascist or fridge Nazi? Um, now I'm known as kettle fascist in my household, uh, and I know someone else who um, is known as the fridge Nazi. Um, and, uh, but basically, I'm sort of I'm always sort of telling, especially poor long suffering Eleanor, uh, telling her off for filling up the kettle too far. Um, hence, she calls me the kettle fascist. <laughs> Um, but I think it's a really sort of um, four main ways of um, reducing, I think, sort of reducing the heat in the kitchen uh, is with the kettle, the oven, the hot water kind of washing up, and the fridge freezer. Though obviously it's very cold, it all you know, um, as we discussed and heard earlier, um, is all about heat basically. Um, 
So, to boil a, kettle, a full one and a half litre kettle costs about 6p. To boil just enough for a cup is about 1.2 pence. Um, so, if I get 85 pence, it's not a lot. But over the course of the year, as you can see, it um, um, makes about a £35 difference. And that's sort of going on the idea of a, you know, a modern, a modern uh, efficient um, kettle that you plug in the wall and sort of induction one. Uh, if you use something like a, a gas one on, a, on your gas stove or something, um, flames going outside, that will probably use um, a lot more energy. Um, but uh, this, I thought, was quite an interesting one to ask us looking into all this. Having said I'm not going to go on about diet stuff. Um, so if you have, on average, uh, four cups of black tea per day, boiling the correct amount of water, 21 kilos of um, CO2 equivalent per year, um, but uh, lattes um, produce a massive amount. And I think, obviously, that's, um, uh, yeah, I think a lot of that's from the milk, um, which is extraordinary. I do have quite a lot of milk in my porridge in the morning. Um, but, uh, go to oat milk. Go to oat milk, yeah, exactly. It <laughs> seems to make sense, doesn't it? We're making porridge, which obviously oats, why not have oat milk? Um, but, um, yeah, domestic oven, most used between um, two and 5,000 watts, um, which is obviously a huge amount of power, um, and it's a, it's a lot of power that takes a lot of time to heat up. Um, so keeping the oven on for minimum time and keeping the door closed for as long as possible, I think are sort of the crucial things. And it, it's one of my real bugbears when um, with recipes. With so often, you know, the first step in a recipe will be preheat the oven to 200 degrees centigrade. In the meantime, you've got to go and I don't know, mix everything up. You've got to go and do a whole load of pre preparation work. So in some of them, you really won't be putting the things in the oven for an hour or longer, so that's the whole time the oven's churning away um, and just, you know, it's always leaking heat inevitably. Um, so um, I think I always say to you, just kind of get to know your oven. Uh, so I know that if I get a baked bread, it's going to take 20 minutes to get up to temperature. Um, and, but if I'm going to bake a, a cake or something, that will only take 10 minutes because it's a much lower temperature. So kind of know your oven. So if you think, oh, okay, I'm at this stage of the recipe, now I'm going to turn on the oven. I think that really makes a big difference. Um, um, yes, and this is um, yeah my other sort of thing is trying to do sort of back to back baking. It's, okay, I probably bake a bit more than most people, so um, it's probably a bit more relevant to me than others. But uh, kind of you obviously put a lot of heat in there. You might as well kind of keep on using that heat. Um, so like tomorrow morning I'll be baking baking off my loaf of sourdough. But then also I'm in <coughs> doing a little test bake for a cakey thing afterwards and the, the, the sourdough is baked a really quite hot up and, and then the cake is a much lower one. Um, and then the, you know, I'm known for being a bit tight around the house, so the, one, the thing I've started doing recently in order to, um, I do generate a lot of washing up as well, is then to actually get a tray or, or a big saucepan and once I've turned the oven off, put that in the, in the oven. And that water obviously will get really nice and hot, and then I can do the washing up for it. Um, which, especially in a sort of funny old house like ours, the hot water tank's way over there, and the sink's down here. And actually, that saves um, a good load of um, good load of energy just from doing little things like that. I know it's a bit sort of might be a bit out there, and it's not quite as convenient as just turning on the hot tap, but. Um, over the course of things makes quite a big change. So um, think different. This is sort of old Apple advert advertising from I think it was 1997 they came out with this one. Um, um, so that's kind of my idea. This was um, quite an interesting job that came up for me where I did have to think different. Um, this is for it was for Smart Energy. You had that slightly tricky job, of, especially back then, of trying to convince people to get smart meters in their house. Um, and when the job, sort of the possibility of the job came up, I said, well, you know, my house is definitely not great. Um, you know, it's very energy inefficient. And also, I do actually have an arger in there, uh, which is not the worst thing you can ever get. Um, which I'm not going to sell if anyone's interested. But <laughs> <laughs> the idea of the job was to um, sort of Instead of baking or yeah, making things in one way, do it in a different way. So thinking differently. So, uh, 
here we had some, um, some kind of steamed buns. So instead of actually baking in the oven, do, the, do some steamed buns on, on the hob, um, which uses far less energy. Um, and we will be discovering that sort of the difference in a moment when we come to these things here. Um, this was doing a, a chicken tagine, um, actually in a slow cooker. Um, so, um, you know, it takes a long time to do it, but once again, it uses far, far less energy than doing a, a, a roast chicken. Um, this is one of these funny little microwave mug cakes, which I think are great, quite fun. To me. So, you particularly loves them for a sort of um, if on rare occasions I haven't actually made the pudding, that kind of has. Um, then uh, she'll, she'll try and make some sort of microwave mug cake. Uh, and then it was um, a no baked cheesecake. Um, so obviously you can make some very nice baked cheesecakes, but actually, especially this time of year, I think some of these um, no baked ones are lovely. Especially uh, the moments with elderflowers around, so this is actually an elderflower and blueberry one. Uh, and then on the left, um, that's uh, it's actually a macaroni cheese, which normally you often sort of bake it, um, but we kind of realised that actually just whacking on the grill just for a couple of minutes, um, just to sort of brown up the top, uses far less energy than um, cooking it in the oven. Um, so, other ways of cooking things, um, microwaves, I know sort of cooking, I don't know, trying to cook a roast chicken in a microwave probably isn't going to look very brown and delicious at the end of it, so it doesn't work for everything, but it's a far more efficient way of, um, of cooking things. Um, and then a slow cooker. Um, this this one came about from a um, funny, interesting um, job I had to do um, for making a, a kind of rye bread um, uh, from something I learned on a trip to Iceland. Um, and it actually works very well because you mix up all these ingredients, put it in a bowl, in the slow cooker, overnight, and then the next morning you've got this, I think, thought this very nice um, bread that came out of it. It's kind of almost like a fruit and loaf. Um, so, yeah, cooking on the hob rather than the oven, as we're going to be doing this evening in just a few minutes. Um, then back to the no cooked cheesecake. Um, and then, if you happen to have it, a boiling spring. So, this was the <laughs> <laughs> Not too good around here for geothermal energy, but this is the job out in, in Iceland where I learned about this rye bread. Um, quite an intriguing thing. This, this hot spring here is actually Europe's largest hot spring. There churned out 180 litres of water, it's boiling water per second. Um, and they would, they would mix up these sort of ingredients for bread, put it in this saucepan, um, seal it all up, uh, and then just put it in the spring for 24 hours, um, which made this um, yeah, pretty, well, as you can see, pretty substantial loaf. Sadly though, it's not going to be terribly much use around here. And then, back to this photograph, the compost heap, yes, I kid you not. Um, this, um, as you know, when you buy your sort of your ham in from the supermarket, it will come in quite a strong sort of um, shrink wrap, plastic wrapper. Um, well, if you've got a good summer's day and you've got loads of grass clippings, it is actually hot enough to, um, to cook a ham in there. Um, and so I did, you know, I put it in there, um, cooked it for about, I think it's about there for about 20 hours, so it's quite a long and slow to cook. Uh, and then I did actually just brown it off with a blowtorch at the end of it. It's <laughs> just a bit of colour, but not very well, but I can highly recommend it for a bit of fun. What temperature um, did you achieve? Uh, I think it's about 60 degrees centigrade it was in there, so it was a, it was a good temperature. I've got, I've got a quite a nice sort of um, temperature probe, so I did check these things first. Um, so yeah, use your lid, uh, and it's obviously sort of putting a lid on a saucepan makes a huge amount of difference, much like insulating your roof. Um, 